If you have your copies of God's Word, let me have you turn to the book of Isaiah. Continue our study in the prophet Isaiah. We're going to be looking at two chapters this morning, chapters 31 and 32. Two chapters. For those of you who have young children, and you hear the phrase, two chapters come out of my mouth, and fear settles over your whole body. One of the chapters only has nine verses. So it's really like one chapter. At any rate, in case you didn't know, verses and chapters aren't inspired by God. They were included in your Bible somewhere around the 10th or 11th century by a pious monk. And uh, I think when he got to Isaiah 31 and 32, it may have been one of those times. He, the legend goes that he was annotating the Bible, putting chapters and verses in as he was riding along in a carriage or on a donkey. And he would fall asleep, and every time the donkey woke him up, he'd go to work again. The legend is, is that perhaps that's why some of the chapter breaks seem a little awkward, is that he perhaps woke up and got startled at awkward times. Well, I think that may have been the instance here in Isaiah 31 and 32. I think these two chapters are actually meant to be one whole chapter. And so we're going to treat it as such. So don't hear me say two chapters. Hear me just say one chapter. I'll just say really fast, 31, 32. It's all just one chapter. We're going to begin in chapter 31. We're going to end in chapter 32. All along up to this point, Isaiah has been up into the grill of the southern kingdom of Judah. Just by way of review, after Solomon, Israel broke out in a civil war. A northern kingdom and a southern kingdom split. The northern kingdom was primarily apostate. All kings that did evil in the sight of the Lord, that loved to form alliances with former allegiance, and they wanted to come down, they wanted to dominate Jerusalem. Some of that is the context of, of Isaiah's prophecy, is the northern kingdom breathing threats against the southern kingdom. And in the midst of all of that, the southern kingdom, Judah, being small and seemingly according to their own eyes, inconsequential, are tempted, much like we are when trouble presses in on us, to trust in things other than God's promises. God has told them exactly who he would be to them and what he would do to them or for them. And yet what they saw in any given moment in their circumstances was more real to them than the promises of God. And what we're going to see in Isaiah 31 and 32 as we've seen in the previous couple of chapters is Judah looks at Assyria and says, whoa, they're really big. They've got Lots of guns, so to speak. We don't have very many. Egypt is really big. They got lots of guns too, so to speak. Horses and chariots. What we need to do is we need to find a big kid on the block to get our back so that we can protect ourselves against Assyria. Never mind the fact that God had already promised that these are the moments that he would be with them. They didn't trust his word. And so Isaiah is calling them through a series of woes. And we're going to find in chapter 31, the fifth woe, a series of woes. Woe to you. So that God as a father might call his children back. It's one of the joys of parenting. Telling your children to go one way and watching them belligerently go the other way. Because at four years old, they know better than you. And so you gently guide them back and still they won't listen and you get a little bit more firm and that's exactly what Isaiah is doing. That God as a loving father is looking at his people, his children. And they've decided in their own wisdom that they're going to go the opposite direction. And that direction leads to destruction. And like a loving father, he's going to discipline his children and bring them back. And what we're going to see in chapters 31 and 32 is really this big idea. This is my sermon in one sentence. Unbelief leads to destruction. But true life comes from turning to God and hearing His word. 
Unbelief leads to destruction, but true life comes from turning to God and hearing his word. If you're on your way in, you may have grabbed one of those outlines. I've outlined the entire chapter, chapters 31 and 32 for you. Verses 1 through 5 function as somewhat kind of like a prologue. It sets the table for the rest of our time. It's really important. So we'll spend a little bit of time here before we move quickly through the rest of of our passage. But beginning of verse 1, just read along with me. This is Isaiah speaking. Woe to those who go down to Egypt for help and rely on horses. We trust in chariots because they are many and in horsemen because they're very strong. But do not look to the Holy One of Israel or consult the Lord. And yet he is wise and brings disaster. He does not call back his words, but will arise against the house of evildoers and against the helpers of those who work iniquity. The Egyptians are man and not God. Their horses are flesh, not spirit. And when the Lord stretches out his hand, the helper will stumble, and he who is helped will fall, and they'll perish together. For thus says the Lord to me, as a lion or a young lion growls over his prey, and when a band of shepherds is called out against him, he is not terrified by their shouting or daunted at their noise. So the Lord of hosts will come down to fight on Mount Zion and on its hill, like birds hovering. So the Lord of hosts will protect Jerusalem. He will protect and deliver it, and he will spare and rescue it. Isaiah isn't speaking woe against a faithless people. You see, everybody trusts in something. And relying on things isn't always a bad thing, is it? Investors trust in market forces. Scientists trust the predictable forces of nature. But not all trusting is good. Trusting in anything, even good things, more than you trust in God and his word, well, that is a misplaced trust. Those things in which you trust more than God, they will always betray you and they will always let you down. Well, Jerusalem was trusting in Egypt. And Isaiah, as you see here in verse 1, speaks a woe over them, a condemnation. This is the fifth consecutive woe, to be exact. Not because Jerusalem was committed to to foreign policy. And not because Jerusalem was committed to having foreign alliances. Those aren't bad in and of themselves. But it was because they relied on these more than they relied on God and His Word. Notice the language in verse 1. It says here that they were relying on horses and trusting in chariots and horsemen. Why? Why? Well, it says right there, because they were massive, because massive and mighty Assyria was breathing down their necks. And so Jerusalem's leaders thought, well, comparatively speaking, we're but a few. Oh, but the chariots of Egypt are mighty. They're many. We may be weak, but the horsemen of Egypt, well, they are strong. But in looking to Egypt, they did not look to the Holy One of Israel. And then before going down to Egypt, they didn't even consult with the Lord who had redeemed them and made a covenant with them. In fact, in verse 2, they had neglected God who is wise and who is sovereign over everything, including evil, even evil like Assyria. All of this was serving his purposes. And they hardened their hearts toward the one whose word never fails and who ultimately destroys his enemies. You know, they had consulted their own history Well, then they would have remembered how all of Egypt's chariots and horsemen fared against God in the Exodus. And yet these are the chariots and the horsemen in which they want to trust? Had they consulted God's word, the psalmist would have reminded them in their national motto, some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. Psalm 27. But there's a catch. Trusting in this God means trusting in what you cannot see. He is not like a man as we see here. God is spirit. Which means that when it comes to trusting in God, you have to learn how not to trust your eyes. That when it comes to trusting God's wisdom, you have to learn not to trust your own wisdom and your own wits, your own instincts. 
But then isn't that what, what the Bible says faith is? That faith is the assurance of things hoped for. It's the conviction of things what? Unseen. And it's right here that Judah's faith breaks down. Verse 3, it's between the seen and the unseen, between trusting in man who has flesh and blood just like us and God who is spirit. They didn't want God's promises. They wanted God's, they wanted human power. And I think if we're honest with ourselves, isn't this where our faith breaks down to? Especially when life gets tough. Our problems in the moment, whoa, they seem so concrete hard and immovable and real. And in those moments, can it feel sometimes like God's promises seem so weak and, and distant and abstract and irrelevant? No, in those moments, what we need is something more practical than the gospel. Or that's what we're tempted to think anyways. Well, in these opening verses, you might think of Assyria as a kind of cipher for anything that troubles you in your life. And you might think of Egypt as anything that you think you need outside of God's promises when trouble comes. That's why Judah was wrong. God had already declared his commitment to them. And that by going back to Egypt for the help that God had already promised them, they were going back to the bondage that God had saved them from in the first place. They were going back to old slave masters to find freedom. Beloved, Jesus is committed to you. And he has given us great promises. He assures us, my peace I give to you. When trouble hits, he comforts. Don't let your hearts be troubled. And even now as he stands with nail-pierced hands, hands that were pierced for you, he promises, I will never leave you, nor will I forsake you. Oh, but let's stop and be honest with ourselves for just a moment. Perhaps be honest for the first time this week. Perhaps for some of you the first time in your life. What is the Assyria that troubles you in your life? And in the midst of that trouble, what is the Egypt that you are trusting in to give you what God has already promised you? Brothers and sisters, listen carefully to me. The fullness of life that you long for and that I long for. Stability and peace, belonging and love. It comes ultimately from spiritual and not earthly sources. There is no life for us in any tangible earthly thing. Take money for an example. Money can buy a house. Money can put food on a table. But it can't make a home and it can't fill that table with laughter and joy. And even when you get some of that money, oh, there's always something or someone waiting to steal it or some circumstance that's bound to destroy it. That's why we don't lay up treasures on earth where moth can destroy and rust can destroy and thieves can steal. We want to lay up treasure in heaven. Oh, what you need for fullness of life doesn't come from this world, but it comes from the grace of God in Christ. Full forgiveness of sins. Full acceptance in a new family with a heavenly father who's un, who has unshakable affection for you. A heavenly inheritance that will never be stolen or destroyed. And love, oh, love that will never let you go. You say, I want that. Yeah, I do too. How do I come to possess that? How does that become mine? How do I, how do I experience that even in the midst of, of my troubles? Friends, it begins by admitting that the Assyria in your life, whatever it is, whatever trouble it brings, isn't your real crisis. Just like Judah, unbelief in God is your real crisis, and that is my real crisis. The real danger in your life is not being exposed to brutal but temporary brutalities in this life. No, our real danger is when our hearts find old slave masters more beautiful and more compelling and more tangible and more practical than Jesus and his word. And the real issue that God is dealing with in your life is not so much the things that you do, but he's dealing with who you are. Who you are. 
Brothers and sisters, every single one of us underestimate the remaining sinfulness in our hearts. We fail to see the extent of our own pride, of our fleshly self-confidence, our selfish ambitions, our stubbornness, our self-justification, our lack of love, our distrust for God. But God sees all of it. He knows all of it down to the very bottom of it. And I'm suggesting to you this morning that whatever trouble God has brought into your life, whatever Assyria he has allowed to come in and press in on you like a vice, he has done it so that he can do two things. Number one, that he would reveal your heart. And number two, that he would refine your faith. That he would reveal your heart and that he would refine your faith. He wants to show you like he's trying to show Judah that what you need most is not a practical and an immediate way to cope with your circumstances. You need Christ. Even if you can't see Him, and even if you don't feel Him in the moment. The Apostle Peter knew his fair share of personal trouble. He was well acquainted with the Lord's discipline and even with his own doubt. But listen to how an aged Peter, now at the end of his life, having grown in the grace and the wisdom of the Lord Jesus Christ over time, listen to, listen to how this aged and wizened Peter encourages troubled believers. He says, in this you rejoice. Though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials various Assyrias so that the tested genuineness of your faith more precious than gold though it's tested by fire may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ and get this and though you have not seen him you love him And though you do not now see him, you rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. One person put it this way, a heart at one with God is the secret to life. To have God is to have all things. To trust him is to be saved. But if you're to trust God, you have to trust what you can't see and you've got to trust God which you may not feel in the way that you wish that you could feel it in any given moment. You have to trust what God has spoken to be true about himself. And you have to remember his great work in your life in the past. In verses three and four, if you notice back in the passage, they reinforce the truth of God's powerful care by giving us two similes, verses four and five rather. First, he says that God is like a lion who is unshaken. He says, shepherds shout and they try to scare him away. But notice that he just stands there and snarls with a sovereign growl. But this lion is also like a bird in his gentle protection. That he spreads his wings over his children. That God is both. He is all of the salvation that we need. That's the point. Judah had forgotten that. They didn't see him. And so they walked away from loving him from trusting him. They saw Assyria, they saw Egypt, and all they could do is measure their circumstances by what they could see, rather than what God had promised. So how is it then that Judah, and how do we get back on track with our true hope in God? We get the answer in the rest of our passage. First of all, in verse six, we are to Turn to him. You see, that's the first three words of verse 6. Turn to him. And then if you flip over a page, chapter 32, we see our second point in verse 9. Not only are we to turn to him, but chapter 32, verse 9, we are to hear his voice. We're to turn to God and we're to hear his voice. So what are the first steps to fullness of life? It's turning to God and it's listening to God. Let's consider the first of these, looking at verse 6. Turn to him from whom people have deeply revolted, O children of Israel. For that day everyone shall cast away his idols of silver and his idols of gold, which your hands have sinfully made for you. And the Assyrians shall fall by a sword, not of man. And a sword, not of man, shall devour him. You see the play on words. 
Verse 3, the Egyptians are a man. That is who Israel is trusting in to slay Assyria on their behalf. But God says Assyria will fall, but it ain't going to be by Egypt. It's not going to be by the ones that you're trusting in. It's not going to be from a man. He says, his rock shall pass away in terror and his officers desert the standard in panic. Rock, they're speaking of his king, the Assyrian king, declares the Lord, whose fire is in Zion and whose furnace is in Jerusalem. The first step to experiencing fullness of life in God is to trash our idols with all of their false promises and to turn to God. In verse 8, God assures Judah that Assyria is not, in fact, their biggest problem. He says, I want you to forget about Assyria. I want you to factor them out of the equation. I am the one that you need to be obsessed with. Well, the fire and the furnace imagery that you see there in verse 9, well, that's just another way of saying that great lion in verse 4, he isn't safe, but he's good. Christian, your best friend in the entire universe is also a living and consuming fire. And getting singed by God so that we learn to stay away from sin and trust Him instead, oh, that's one of the best things that could ever happen to you. And we should be quick, as quick to interpret God's discipline as God's love for us as we do His blessings in our life. Because when Jesus promised, I will never leave you or forsake you, he is not only promising his continuing presence in your life, he is promising holy confrontation when you abandon him. The old Puritan Stephen Charnock helpfully reminds us, we often learn more of God under the rod that strikes us than under the staff that comforts us. We learn more of God under a rod that strikes us than under the staff that comforts us. A good friend in mine, a faithful brother in Christ, once wrote about the hardest year of his life. He had a young career, a growing career, and a young wife. Everything looked so great on the outside. Everything looked so put together. But privately, he was addicted to pornography. That was his Egypt. And then he got singed by the fire of Zion. And it was painful, but as he recounts, it was the best thing that ever happened to him. He wrote, coming into the light was scary. I handed over the reins of control to God and other people. For so long, I tried to control my world by covering up my sin, but God summoned me to surrender. And I could do nothing in those days but open my hands and allow him to work through imperfect people in an imperfect process in his perfect way. And I became convinced that God could be trusted with the consequences of my disobedience. That is profound. True godly repentance doesn't just trust that God will get me out of the consequences of my sin unscathed. Godly repentance says that I can trust God even with the consequences of my sin, whatever they may be. He goes on, God convinced me through his word that my sin had made this mess and that I needed to remain and I needed to endure its effects. He says, at one point I remember lying face down on my bedroom carpet. I cried out, I've confessed every sin I've ever committed, God. I don't know what else to do. He didn't speak audibly to me, but I sensed him saying, now I will begin to use you. The Lord had crushed me because he loved me and because he wasn't finished with me yet. He concludes, I shudder to think what would have happened had God never exposed my sin and crushed me as he did. He calls that year the year of the anvil. That's what anvils do. They get crushed and reshaped. He says, I shudder to think what would have happened had God never exposed my sin and crushed me as he did. He says, it was the worst and best year of my life. I would never want to go through it again. But I wouldn't trade the nearness to God that I gained from it for anything. We often learn more 
of God under the rod that strikes us than under the staff that comforts us. Brothers and sisters, when your heart is awakened to the supreme value of Christ, you don't ask what price you have to pay to get real with him. You say, if I lose everything but gain Christ, I gain everything. He is true life. But as long as your heart is wondering, can I really afford these losses? Is Christ really worth that price? The price of those friends, the price of that job, the price of that money, the price of this reputation. Is Christ really worth losing all of that? Then the cost will always seem too great. Isaiah is saying to Judah and he is saying to us, turn back to God even with your idols and even with all of your doubts and he will graciously help you suffer the loss of all things so that you might gain him. And you won't regret it because you'll come to know in that moment exactly what the psalmist meant when he wrote, you make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy and at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Who here didn't show up wanting life, joy, pleasures? We all want it, don't we? Only here's the catch. The path of life is only made known to us by God. You will not find it apart from his word. The fullness of joy that all of our hearts long for deeply than, more deeply than anything can only be found in his presence, not from fleeing from it. And the pleasures that, that our heart pursues and all of our pursuits of happiness aren't found in the handouts of this world, but in the right hand of God. There's only one place that you can find those things. And it's in Christ. I wonder how many of you are beaten and battered because you have sought those things and things other than Christ. That when confronted with a Assyrias in your life, whether in your marriage or your job or your body or whatever it may be, when confronted with those Assyrias, you look at God and you look at Egypt. God seems abstract, unhelpful, impractical. Assyria seems to have the solution to your problem. Boom, I'm going to Syria or Egypt. That path is always a path to destruction. Life, joy, pleasure, fullness of life is only found in God and in God alone. So who then is Christ for whom we should be willing to give up everything in order to gain him? Well, Isaiah gives us a glimpse in the next chapter. At the end of chapter 31, Isaiah is calling Judah to return to God's mountain because he says at the beginning of chapter 32, that's where God's king rules his people. Beginning in verse 1, Behold, a king will reign in righteousness. Princes will rule in justice. Each will be like a hiding place from the wind, a shelter like the storm, like streams of water in a dry place, like the shade of a great rock in a weary land. And then the eyes of those who will see will not be closed and the ears of those who hear will give attention. The heart of the hasty will understand and know and the tongue of the stammerers will hasten to speak distinctly. The fool will no longer be called noble for the scoundrel said to be honorable. For the fool speaks folly and his heart is busy with iniquity to practice ungodliness and to utter error concerning the Lord. To leave the craving of the hungry unsatisfied and to deprive the thirsty of drink. As for the scoundrel, his devices are evil. He plans wicked schemes to ruin the poor with lying words. And even, even when the plea of the needy is right, but he who is noble plans noble things. And on noble things he stands. Here we have a glimpse of a new people in God's kingdom. And we notice that those who rule and serve in this kingdom do so in righteousness. And they do so in righteousness because that's what their king is like. Who is this Christ for whom we should be willing to give up everything? He is a king who reigns in righteousness. Some of you here perhaps have been deceived into thinking that you've accepted Christ as a personal savior, but not as a king. 
Friends, the Son of God did not come to save us in our sin. He came to save us from our sin. To be saved from your sins is to be saved from ignoring and despising the sovereign authority of this king over you. It is to get off the road of self-will and self-pleasing and it's to surrender to God's authority, to yield to his dominion and to give yourself entirely to be ruled by him and his word. Responding to the gospel by turning to God means submitting to a king. You don't get all the blessings of the gospel without submitting to the king. And verse 1 promises that Jesus is not like all the megalomaniacs that rule over us in the rest of the world. Many of us are skeptical toward authority. We've been hurt and wounded and misled. We've been lied to and abused. Oh, but Jesus is not like those rulers. He is, according to verse 1, a king who will reign over us in perfect righteousness. That in Christ you will find a king and a ruler unlike any other. The kind of king that makes it worth turning back from Egypt and throwing away your self-sovereignty. Notice in verse 2, his righteousness makes him a shelter from the storm. He will secure you and guard you. In him you'll discover a stream of of water in a dry place, he will refresh your dry and your sin-cracked heart. You'll find shade in a weary land, a place of comfort where you can finally let down all of your defenses, get real with him for the first time, and find rest. In verses 3 and 4, your spiritual blindness and dullness, oh, it's replaced with a fresh spiritual awareness. Your senses are all of a sudden made alive to God. And through the power of the gospel, the eyes of our hearts are enlightened so that we know not only the hope of our inheritance in Christ, uh, but also God's transforming power. That's Ephesians 1. Ryan's preaching on that next week. Ryan Adams, that is. Going to bring the wood. According to verses 5 through 8, though, notice that the righteousness of this king leaves us changed people. Transform from scoundrels to nobles. That is that the fire of Zion burns away all the lying and all the deceit and all the injustice from his people. And in verse 8, fills his kingdom with those who love righteousness. That God's people rule and serve from noble character. That they reflect the character of their king. That all of those in this kingdom begin to manifest spiritual fruit in keeping with spiritual life, love, peace, Patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Brothers and sisters, our Lord Jesus Christ has inaugurated this kingdom and this life in us already through the power of his gospel. And by his grace, our individual lives and our love for one another, we make his invisible kingdom that we see here in verses 1 through 8 visible to the world. Love, justice, righteousness, safety, belonging, all of it is available to sinners in Christ. A place to belong in a family with a father and an older brother in Christ who is not ashamed of them, but who becomes a shelter to them and a nourishing stream to them and a shade to comfort them. D.A. Carson wrote this, the kingdom of heaven is worth infinitely more than the cost of discipleship. In, or, in other words, everything that you have to give up in order to follow Jesus faithfully the kingdom that you gain is worth infinitely more than that. And he says, those who know where the treasure lies, joyfully abandon everything else to secure it. Why would you gain everything in this life and yet lose your life? I know I say that you must lose your life if you would gain it, Jesus says. How is it that we come to secure it? kingdom and a king like this? How does it become ours? Isaiah has told us that the first step is to turn to God. And now the second step beginning in verse 9 in chapter 32 is related to the first, that we turn to God by listening to God's word. As we'll see, that's the instrument used by the Holy Spirit to renew us. Rise up, you women who are at ease. Hear my voice, you complacent daughters. Give ear to my speech. In little more than a year, you will shudder, you complacent women, for the grape harvest fails and the fruit harvest will not come. Tremble, you women who are at ease. Shudder, you complacent ones. Make yourselves bare. Tie sackcloth around your waist. Beat your breasts for the present fields 
for the fruitful vine, for the soil of my people growing up in thorns and briars. Yes, for all the joyous houses in the exultant city. For the palace is forsaken. The populous city is deserted. The hill and the watchtower will become dens forever. A joy of wild donkeys and a pasture of flocks. Is Isaiah picking on women here? No, but he is making an example of them for all of us. Notice in these verses that it's harvest time in Judah. Everyone's rejoicing. The harvest has come in. That's what we see in verse 13. Joyous houses, an exultant city. But Isaiah crashes the party. And he warns these women that in the following year, in verse 10, the crops are going to fail. But what exactly is Isaiah doing here? What he's doing is he's using the women of Jerusalem as an illustration of spiritual complacency. In fact, notice that Isaiah uses that word, complacent, three times in verses 9, 10, and 11. Listen, there's nothing wrong with a pleasant life. There's nothing wrong with rejoicing in God's provision. We should give thanks always, but that's not what these women are doing. These women were living for the false peace of momentary indulgences. So here's the big picture. We saw earlier that the men in the royal court are they're just wringing their hands over Assyria, fretting over a danger that God had already promised to take care of. But the women at home, well, they're not worried about anything. Not because they're trusting in God, not because they're resting in God, but because they don't long for anything more than the next party, the next fix, the next social outing, the next bargain in the market. I wonder how unlike these women are we when escaping the challenges of our own lives with leisure. How when we do, we so often numb ourselves to God and His Word, whether it's through video games or nightly television, fantasy novels or sports, by abusing food or alcohol, by spending money that we don't have because having new stuff makes us feel better. No, like rejoicing in the harvest, none of these things are inherently bad things. New things aren't bad things. Sports, novels, Games and tell those those aren't necessarily inherently bad things unless, of course, they reinforce a spiritual complacency. Unless they lull us to sleep, unless they become like sleeping pills in our spiritual lives. Doling us and lulling us to sleep, spiritually speaking. These women represent the kind of happiness that will ultimately destroy us. That is earthly contentment with no desire for God. Furthermore, the spiritual state of these women should come as no surprise to us if, in fact, the men in the court are leading their homes in the same way that they're leading the nation. No God, no gospel, only what we can see, only pragmatism, only what works. If it works, it must be true. Oh, how many houses stray away from the living God without even knowing it, give themselves into spiritual complacency and worldliness because of men who will not lead. Brothers, every single one of us need to grow in the grace and the knowledge in Christ so that our homes, so that our cities, so that our houses don't look like this. That we would value more what we can't see than what we can see. That we would value more the rod that comes from God than we would the pleasures of this world. But in all of this, here's Isaiah's point. There's no place among God's people for worldly complacency. But there is a way back to God. Some of us need to turn off our televisions and shut our novels and we need to take time to listen to God's word with hearts that are open so that we might be able to accept even the hard truths that are calling us to change. And you'll discover in that moment that the good news of the gospel is that in Christ, through the Holy Spirit, God is committed to working in you the very things that he demands from you. And that is is grace. And that's where we're going in verse 15. The palace has been forsaken, the populous city is deserted. God's rod has fallen heavy on his people. 
Verse 15, until the Spirit is poured upon us from on high. And the wilderness becomes a fruitful field, and the fruitful field is deemed a forest. Then justice will dwell in the wilderness, righteousness will abide in the fruitful field, and the effect of righteousness will be peace. And the result of righteousness, quietness and trust forever. My people will abide in a peaceful habitation and secure dwellings and in quiet resting places. This is what God promises to those who turn to Him and hear His word. And here we see the spiritual nature of God's kingdom reappearing as the whole passage comes full circle. This is what it looks like when the Spirit of God dominates and transforms everything in His kingdom. In fact, all throughout the book of Isaiah, God promises to pour out His Spirit upon us with life-transforming abundance. That The renewal of God's people is central to Isaiah's message, and He brings it into focus here in chapter 32. And I want you to notice that He isn't talking about a, a steady drip of the Spirit like that leaky faucet in your house, or at least in my house. He is poured out on high. It is a spiritual deluge. Nothing is being held back. God is infinitely generous with what he offers his people through his spirit in Christ. All doubt and dullness and complacency, oh, it's all swept away in this deluge by God's righteousness. And then notice in verse 17 that the effect of this righteousness on the church is righteousness and quietness and trust forever. Friends, you realize God is keeping his promise. This is exactly what he has been doing for the past 2,000 years. If you want something to do this afternoon, go home. Turn off the cowboy game, won't be worth it anyways. Read through the book of Acts. And I want you to take note of how often you see the poured out Holy Spirit working through the word to convert and transform sinners and to build God's people, the church, and the sheer number of references, the work of the Spirit through His Word to do God's work as we see promised here is staggering. And the Word was multiplying, and the church was multiplying, and many were being added to their number day by day, over and over and over. Everything that God says is going to happen when the Spirit is poured out has happened, and it is happening. You realize that's why we're gathered here today. It's because God is a promise-keeping God. But God has not just poured out His Spirit to convert. See that in verse 17? What the result of this righteousness is that is poured out? It is quietness and trust forever. He is not just converting, but He's comforting. I think the Apostle Paul captures well what Isaiah is implying here. In Romans chapter 5, he says, We rejoice in our suffering knowing that suffering produces endurance. Endurance produces character. Character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Did you catch that? God's love, the love that we doubted when we went to Egypt, the love that we rejected when we feared Assyria and looked to those things that we could see, the love of God that he has set on us in Christ from before the very foundation of the world, that love he has poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Verse 15, until the Spirit is poured upon us from an eye. What is he pouring? According to the Apostle Paul, he's pouring love into his people. That we might be comforted. And through that righteous love, there would be quietness and trust forever. You notice the, the progress Looking back at the beginning of chapter 31. Go to Egypt for help. Rely on horses, trust in chariots. Only those things that you can see. That is a road to destruction. And yet, God in his love stops his people in their tracks. Brings them under the authority of a righteous king. And then that king pours out his spirit upon them in righteousness and the trust that they were given away to Egypt. Now in verse 17, the result of that righteousness is trust in God forever. 
God is the one that will do this in our lives. We just have to be receptive to it and stop rebelling against it. So these two themes in chapter 32, the kingship of Christ and the outpouring of the Spirit, brothers and sisters, these are the secret, it's the secret power of God's people and nothing less, nothing else. Notice how Isaiah closes in the last two chapters, the last two verses. He puts two undeniable truths side by side. All along, Isaiah has been saying, you don't need to run to Egypt. God will save you. And now he concludes by saying two things. He says first in verse 19, the newness that God brings does not leave this world unchanged. Assyria is cut down. Judah is humbled. Oh, but God works in surprising ways through unexpected circumstances. And that through the destruction of verse 19, a remnant of spiritually happy people emerge in verse 20. And here in this final verse, Isaiah paints a picture of a people at peace. They're richly supplied. There's quietness and trust. And all of this pastoral imagery is really just an Old Testament way of saying what Paul says to believers in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And if you are in Christ, listen, because this is true of you. All things are yours. Whether the world, life or death, or the present or the future, all are yours. And you are Christ's, and Christ is God's. The reason that you can give up everything or anything to trust in Christ and to give your life to Him and His Word, the reason you can give up your reputation, those friendships, those addictions, the reason those things can be given up and left behind is not only because they've proven to be unworthy saviors in your life, incapable of keeping their promises, but the reason that you can give all of them up is because when you lose those things and gain Christ, you gain everything. All things are yours. You are Christ's, and Christ is God's. So as we come to the table this morning, we each need to ask, do I believe this? I don't mean do I merely mentally assent to it, but does my life, my marriage, my parenting, my sexual life, my financial life, my friendships, my receptivity to God's word and to godly counsel being given to me by godly brothers and sisters, does my life prove that I believe this, that this king is worthy of my life? Do I really believe that I have no need of Egypt because in Christ I have everything I need? That his promises are mine, his righteousness is mine, his protection and refreshment and comfort is mine. That sin cannot promise me anything that God has not already promised and given me in Christ. That I just need to be patient and wait on God. He will save me. Do you believe that? Oh, let's come to the table and let's be nourished. Have our faith nourished as we feed on Christ together by faith. Trusting that in Him, we have everything.